So what is this all about? We want to start reasoning about sequences of random variables. So rather than having a fixed base net with a fixed set of random variables, we want there to be a sequence of them that keeps going on in principle forever. Applications are speech recognition. We have a stream of s speech signals coming in, some kind of sound wave, and you somehow want to make sense of it. Another application is robot localization. A robot could be going around, let's say, a building. While it's going around, it could get sensory readings from cameras, from lasers, and so forth. And as these sensory readings come in, you want to reason about them and maybe infer something about the location of the robot in the building, maybe even map out the building as you go along. Another example application is user attention modeling. Imagine you are building a website and you want to model where users will look on your website. As they land on your page, where are they, uh, their eyes focusing first? Where do they go from there? Do they land on the things you want them to look at? Um, that's a sequence over time. However much time that user spends on your page, you might want to model exactly how they spend that time. Medical monitoring, imagine uh, some, somebody, some patient in an intensive care unit. Um, they usually have a lot of sensors hooked up to them. And what you'd like to monitor is the condition of the patient. And what you get is this sequence of sensory signals and somehow you want to infer the state of the patient over time and maybe trigger an alarm whenever something funny comes up. So to do this, instead of having a fixed base net, we want a base net that grows over time. And these types of base nets, the canonical ones, are called Markov models. Here's what they look like. You have a chain structured base net. Each node has the same distribution, meaning that the distribution for X2, the CPT here, and the CPT here, and the CPT here, are the same. So we have one CPT for XT plus one given XT. X here could be the state of the patient, uh, the location of an agent, and so forth. The only one that's different is the first one over here, which has its own CPT, which is the initial distribution at time one. Okay, so that's our Markov model. We have two CPTs, enough to capture the entire temporal sequence. Was the question here? A CPT is a conditional probability table. Okay, so that's our model. New type of base net, and the special thing here is that this just keeps on going. The CPT, this one here, is called a transition model as it models how you go from time t to time t plus one. It's actually a lot like what we had for Markov decision processes. It's actually the same, except now that there is no action available to us. It's just the model from state to state as opposed to from state and action to state. Okay, so what assumptions are we making in this type of model? Remember that when we have a base net, by looking at the graph, we can infer conditional dependencies that are guaranteed to be true no matter what numbers are being chosen for the CPTs. So for this type of model, Markov model, what is the main assumption we make is one that if we know what the state is at the current time, so X at the current time, then that makes conditionally dependent any variable before that time from any variable after that time. Why? This is a causal reasoning process, and we observe this node over here makes this triple inactive, and hence x4 and x1 will be conditionally dependent given this variable here, but the same for x3 and x1 and so forth. Anything that is in past and future, any pair that is on combined both sides will be conditionally dependent given the current time. Okay, that's the big assumption we make. Um, let's look at an example. Here is a canonical example. We have the state could take on the value rain or sun. The initial distribution is all probability on sun. We have this conditional probability table here for xt given xt minus one. 90% of the time, it'll stay sunny whenever it's sunny at the current time. And when it's rainy, 70% of the time, it'll stay rainy. And here's an example of what could be a temporal process that happens. You start with sunny, sunny again on the next day, 
then rainy, then rainy, and then sunny again. So far, just a base net, but because it's such a special type of base net that has a lot of applications, and it has some very specific structure in that the CPT is the same for all times, people have started to look at other ways of representing that conditional probability table. Here's one other way of representing it. Um, this graph here. What is this showing? It's showing us, as nodes, the two values the state can take on. Rain and sun are the two values in the domain. Those are the two nodes in the graph. Then the arrows denote possible transitions. So when it's sunny, with probability 0 0.9, it stays sunny. With probability 0 0.1, it becomes rainy. And similar for rain. So this here is not a base net. It's a conditional probability table represented as a directed graph. Another way to represent the same conditional probability table is this way here. It's essentially the same as what we already had, but unrolled over time. You have time t minus 1 here, time t here. You have the same transitions as we had over here, just rolled out. Okay? Again, not a base net, just a different way of writing out a conditional probability table. You have this here, which is a table. You have this here, which is one graph, and then this here, which is the unrolled version of that graph. One, two, and three are completely equivalent ways of representing the CPT. You choose yours, sometimes one is more useful than the other. Okay, so let's say we're given such a CPT. We know at time one, it's sunny. What is the distribution after one step? So what do we have for P X2? What this is saying here is that P X1 equals sun equals 1.0. Well, we can go back to basic probability. What is P X2? Well, it's equal to the sum over all possible values for x1 of the joint for x2 and x1. Then for the type of model we have, we would write this out as sum over x1, distribution for x2 given x1 times the prior for x1, because that's the tables we have available. And then we could start filling this in. Um, x1 is always sun, so we actually end up with um, probability of x2 given sun times p sun plus probability x2 given rain times probability for rain for x1. Now this here is zero, so this part doesn't matter. This is one, and this thing here, well, it depends on what we want for x2. Let's say we want to know how likely it is that it's sunny, then we look at px2 equals sun equal to px2 equals sun given x1 equals sun times px1 equals sun, and the rain part doesn't contribute, and we get 0 0.9 times 1, which is 0 0.9. So just using basic probability, we can infer that at time 2, probability of sun is 0 0.9. Okay. Now, if you keep doing this, the same process of going from time 1 to time 2, then from time 2 to time 3, and so forth, you are applying what is called the mini-forward algorithm. It's a very straightforward algorithm to apply. And it's actually variable elimination. You're eliminating variables one at a time, starting with x1, then x2, then x3, and so forth. So you start with x1 known, and then for any next one, you just apply this recursion over here. Any questions about the algorithm? before we study some properties of it. Okay, so that's a mini-forward algorithm. Now let's see what happens if we apply this. And we're going to let t go all the way till infinity. Yes? How do we derive this? We derive this as follows. We say p x2 is equal to sum over x t minus 1 
it's actually xt here. So pxt is sum over xt minus one, the joint of xt minus one and xt. This joint here is equal to this expression over here. That's just um, the way we define conditional probability. And this one is the CBT that's given. And this one we get from the previous step of the recursion. All right, so we know how to run the mini forward algorithm. Let's see what happens if we actually run it on our example. So we start with all sun, probability one. We apply this, we get 0 0.9, 0 0.1. We apply this again, 0 0.84, 0 0.16. Apply this again, keep applying this. And I ran this till t equals infinity and at t equals infinity, it happens to land at 0 0.75 and 0 0.25. What do I mean with that? I kept running it with t increasing to higher and higher numbers and saw that it stabilized at 0 0.75, 0 0.25. It converged to that number. Now, then, I did the same thing starting from 0, 1. And did an update we get 0, 0.3, 0 0.7. Do the update again. We get 0 0.48, 0 0.52. Kept running this, and again I noticed that as t gets very large, the distribution we find converges to 0 0.75, 0 0.25. Then I put in a lot of other numbers, not 0, 1 to start with, but any p that lies in 0 and 1, Anything I put in there, I keep running this, what I get is this over here. So this is really interesting. What this is showing is that independent of how you started out, no matter what the initial condition was, it could have been 100% certain it's sunny on the first day, 100% certain it's rainy. It could be a distribution over them. After infinitely many days have passed, you will find the same distribution. Always 0 0.75, 0 0.25. All right, so that's just an observation for what we looked at here. It turns out this is actually true for many, many Markov models, almost all of them. You have to make very pathetic choices of your CPT for it to not happen. So this is a very interesting property that by keep applying the update, we reach the same stationary distribution. What that really means is that Somehow in this process, we forgot where we started from. That information is completely lost. Somehow the stochastic process took over, and on its own, the CPT determined what the final distribution is. The initial distribution played no role anymore. Let's assume that's true. It's almost always the case for a Markov model. Then we can also write out what that distribution will be at time t equal infinity. Here's the equation we can write down. We can say at time t equal infinity, the probability for a particular value for x should be the same as the value we get at infinity plus one. If that's the case, then we have converged. What do we have at time infinity plus one? Well, we had just applied the update equation. It's what we had at time infinity multiplied with the conditional for the next time given the current time, and then some overall instantiations for the current time. That's just the same update equation we had over here, just apply to t equals infinity and t equals infinity plus one, and this is here what we get. This gives us a set of equations actually. So thinking back to the rain and sun example, how can we find these numbers by applying this equation over here? Well, what do they say? They say p infinity sun is equal to Sum over x, what is x? It can be rain or sun, so it's probability t plus one given t of sun given sun times p infinity sun plus p t plus one given t sun given rain times p infinity for rain. And the 
stationary distribution value for rain similarly is the probability of getting into rain from sun times the probability of being at sun plus the probability of getting from rain into rain times the probability of starting out with rain. The subscript is t plus 1 given t. And the other subscript is infinity. It's an 8 rotated horizontally. So what we have here is a set of equations, two equations, two unknowns. What are our unknowns? The unknowns are p infinity sun sitting here, here, and here, and p infinity rain, which is sitting here, here, and here. So these are two linear equations in two unknowns. You should be able to solve this fairly straightforward with linear algebra. And we can find what the stationary distribution is. To make this even more concrete, we can fill in numbers for these. This transition here was sun to sun was 0 0.9. Um, sun given rain was 0 0.3. Rain given sun was 0 0.1. And rain given rain was 0 0.7. So we have a system of equations here. We can call this one maybe x. We can call this one y. What we have is x equals 0.9x plus 0.3y, and y equals 0.1x plus 0.7y. Those are our two equations. x and y are the two entries in the stationary distribution. Now, there's one caveat here. You can read all the solution very easily. That's not the solution we want, which is the all zero solution, right? X zero, Y zero, that works, but that's not a distribution. That's not the one we want. So we have an additional equation here that X plus Y equals one. You might say, oh, three equations, two unknowns, might not be a solution. That's true in general, there might not be a solution. For these types of models, there will be a solution, even though there are three equations and two unknowns. If you solve this system of three equations and two unknowns, you will find the 0 0.75 and the 0 0.25 as the values for x and y. So this is how we find the stationary distribution. Why do we care about the stationary distribution? Um, well, it's interesting to know that you forget about the initial distribution, but it has a lot of other interesting properties. Um, let's go back in time and look at an application of stationary distributions. So, back in 1998, um, early days of the internet, what was going on was that people were putting up web pages. You know, you could buy a domain name like Coca-Cola and then sell it to Coca-Cola company for a lot of money. Those were the days. But really, what was, what was also interesting was that all these people putting up these web pages, a lot of people putting up just random stuff that's not interesting to you. So you want to find the right pages. Keep in mind, Google didn't exist yet, you know, so you weren't using Google to find the right pages. But people were still trying to find the right pages, and they would catalog them. They would make catalogs. Yahoo would build a directory of where you can find web pages that are interesting about cars, let's say, or about computers and so forth. Um, it was very tedious. A lot of manual labor involved in kind of cataloging all these web pages. Then um, Sergey Brin and Larry Page came around. At the time, they were uh, graduate students at Stanford, and they were working on the digital libraries project there. And they said, well, we want to catalog web pages more automatically. So they said, let's build an index. And so if somebody types in a word, I'll return all web pages that have that word on it. So that's great. But now the problem is that a lot of web pages could have that word on it. So the question then becomes, which one of all these web pages are you going to return? And until that time, what people would do is they would say, well, let's return the web pages that have the word the most often. So maybe you could have a web page with car a million times written on it. Somebody search for car, that would be the favorite page for that thing to return, which is obviously not the right metric. And just looking at the page itself, it's really hard to find the right metric. So the kind of innovative idea they came up with was to say that, yes, we want to return in principle all the pages with the word car on it, but we want to rank them. I want to rank them in a meaningful way, and the way we're going to rank them is by somehow deciding which web pages are more relevant than others. And rather than going the Yahoo route of hiring a lot of people 
that will look at those web pages and then give them a score, we want to automate this. And this said, the way we're going to automate it is by looking at a random web surfer. The random web surfer starts on the internet somewhere on a page, randomly follows a link, then again, on that new page, randomly follows a link and keeps going. You run many of these simulations in parallel, and you keep track of how often each page on the internet gets visited. And how often a page gets visited is representative of how interesting a page is, because it's representative of how many people link to it, and not just how many people link to it, but also how many relevant pages, because a lot of people would go to that page, link to this page. Let's say you're a page that a lot of people land on, under this random web surfer model, then wherever you link to will carry a lot of weight in this algorithm. So you get this recursive definition where important pages can carry a lot of weight in terms of giving way to pages they point to. What, you just, what we just defined here is actually a Markov model. The random web surfer is a Markov model defined over the entire internet. The state space, the values the state can take on is every possible web page on the internet. And you just simulate it. That's one thing you could do, or you could, in different ways, compute the stationary distribution, because that's essentially what they were doing. They're computing the stationary distribution of a Markov model, and the entries in the stationary distribution are the page rank of that page. Because they denote, on the average, how much time the random web surfer would spend on that page. Now, compared to what I said, there's a little bit of a discrepancy that they had to build in. Um, the little thing that you have to do is, with probability C, which is a small number, maybe 0 0.1, you just randomly go to a new page, not based on the links in your current page. This ensures that people can't try to trap your random web server down some tunnel and where it can't get out very easily. So with probability C, you randomly go anywhere on the internet, and then with probability 1 minus C, you randomly pick a link on the current page and follow it. Initial distribution could be uniform over pages, or you could have a prior in terms of how much you care about certain pages. That's up to you. So you'll spend more time on the highly reachable pages, and this is really Google 1.0. This is why if you had been around in 98 and you were searching the web before this came around, you were always struggling and bookmarking things. And after this came around, you stopped book bookmarking things because you could just type it into Google and it would actually find the relevant page for you. And then they made it into a big business, obviously. But this was the key idea that set them apart from the other search engines at the time, using the stationary distribution of this random web surfer model to rank pages. Any questions about this application? Yes? How big is C? Um, the numbers I've seen is something like 0 0.1 which would mean that you only about nine times follow a link before you get reset. Is, is that big? Well, the, pro the reason C is relatively large is because if C were too small, you would get trapped. People could set up series of web pages that you keep going down, and, and they could set up dead ends, dead end web pages that just link to themselves, and you kind of get trapped down those paths and never get back out or it would take a really long time if C were too small. Um, you don't necessarily miss out because you still uniformly reset, so you can still reset anywhere within the Wikipedia site. You don't have to reset at the entry page necessarily. You can reset anywhere, and people could link to anywhere on that Wikipedia page. And if there's really a page that's very, very deep in, that you can only reach in a very particular way, and nobody else is linking to it, then this might rightfully so claim that that page is just not that relevant because nobody has bothered making it easy to get there. Okay, let's look at another application. This is an application um, it's really a theory application, and the star here denotes that we're not going to quiz you about this, but it's a really interesting idea. Remember we said GIP sampling is this really great thing where you, if you run this process forever, you get samples from the correct distribution, from the distribution of the 
unobserved variables given the observed variables. Um, we can actually prove that now with this machinery if we wanted to. So let's say x1 through xn are the hidden variables union the query variables, so all the unobserved variables. In GIP sampling, what happens is you randomly pick one of these x variables and you resample it from this distribution over here. And the reason it was nice is because we could very efficiently sample from that distribution. Sampling one variable with all the others fixed is very efficient to do. Now it turns out that if you follow this GIP sampling process and you look at it as a Markov model, so what does that mean? It means that a full instan every full instantiation of all variables is a value in the domain of your state space. And so if you have, let's say, this case, n binary variables, there would be two to the n different state values. And you'd be hopping around between these two to the n states as you run GIP sampling. You can prove that this converges, that the, you can prove that this process has, has a stationary distribution that is at time t equal infinity, the distribution of this process is the actual distribution you're after, namely this distribution over here. How do you do this? Well, you go back to the definition of stationary distribution. You can try this on your own. Essentially, you have to write out this condition here and then show that this thing here under this resampling process as the model that you're using satisfies that stationary distribution equation. That's all you need to do to show that GIP sampling indeed will, if you run it long enough, at the end, draw a sample from the correct distribution. Because at the end of this process, you draw from whatever t, t equals infinity the distribution is, which is a stationary distribution, which is this one. It requires a little bit of algebraic manipulation to get this to work out, but that's really all you have to do, a little bit of algebraic manipulation, and you'll find that this is indeed, this is your p infinity of that GIP sampling process. All right, so that's Markov models. Now, in many applications, you don't get just a sequence of states, but you get a sequence of states that you might be curious about. You don't get to observe those, but you get to observe sensory measurements as proxies for your states, and want to reason about this type of temporal process. So let's look at that. This is called a hidden Markov model. It's still a BaseNet, but again, a special type of BaseNet where things keep going on forever. Forever here, we get time one, two, three, four, and it keeps going. Just like in a Markov model, the CPTs are always the same. So we have a CPT for xt given xt minus one, and we have a CPT for the evidence variable at time t given xt. Those are the two CPTs that we're working with. And then, of course, there's the one for at time one. Okay, just a standard BaseNet, just one that grows infinitely long. Here's an example. Yes? Does E need a subscript at all? In which case? Here? Well, let me write it, spell that a little more explicitly. So we have that P for XT equals sum XT given XT minus one equals sum XT minus one. That's a specific entry in the, in the model. It's the same no matter what T you're using. And same for the evidence variables, P ET equals ET given XT equals XT is the same no matter what time in the XT you're at. So in principle, maybe you could decide to write it as just something that looks like this, but then you might forget that it's really about um, a temporal process. But you're right that this T could be anything, so maybe you could decide to leave it out. Okay, so here's a new example. Um, cruel one to our grad students. Here's the story. Um, the grad student 
is always in the office. A grad student in the office doesn't get any windows, so the grad student never knows whether it's sunny or rainy outside. That's the hidden state. The grad student is still curious whether it's sunny or rainy outside, so the grad student has a hidden mark of model and tries to keep track of the weather, and the observation they get is that their professor, once a day, comes by on their way home, and either the professor is carrying an umbrella or the professor is not. And based on that, the grad student can try to keep track of the weather outside in this HMM. All right, now everybody wants to become a grad student. <laughs> so, that's the running example, that's the idea. Then, we have here 70% chance of remaining rainy when it's already rainy, and 30% chance of becoming rainy when it was not rainy before. The professor, 90% of the time, has an umbrella when it's rainy, and 20% of the time has an umbrella when it's not rainy. Okay, so that's our HMM. Here, we actually left out the time indices. These are often called the emission probabilities because you're emitting some sensory information. These are the transition probabilities, and this is the initial distribution. Those are just names for these particular models. All right, here's another one, closer to what we've been working on in 188, Ghostbusters. Remember we had a ghost in a grid? We don't know where the ghost is, we could put down a sensor. That sensor would be a noisy observation of where the ghost might be, and then we could run inference in a base net to recover the position of the ghost with at least a distribution for it. Um, now something changes. Now the ghost can move around from time t to t plus one. So we have a transition model for the ghost, where the ghost, in a lot of the examples we look at, moves in some clockwise fashion around the grid, but with some noise. So here's an example. If the ghost were to start over here, 50% chance lands over here, one-sixth over here, one-sixth over here, one-sixth over there. That's one entry in the conditional probability table for when the ghost starts in the two, three coordinates position. In addition, we have the sensors. We have discussed the sensors at length before, where you get to measure different colors depending on how far away the ghost is. And so what you have now is a hidden Markov model. These are the ghost positions here. Ghost positions over time. And this here are the sensory measurements over time. It goes on however long you want to run this model. Um, you can run inference in this model, and that way try to keep track of where the ghost might be. What are the assumptions we're making? Again, whenever we put down a graphical model, we make very specific assumptions that will be true no matter what the CPT entries are. And we can read those off just from the graph by running D separation. So, usually these two words are use the other way around, hidden Markov process. Um, the future depends on the past through the present. So the current, if you have an observation at the current time, let's say, if you were to know the state x3, then states x1 and x2 are independent of x4, given that you know x3. That's one assumption. Another one is that if you observe the current state, let's say currently it's x2, then the current measurement at time two, which gives us the evidence variable e2, is independent of all the other variables. So e2 is independent of, this really any other variable, I'll put z, given x2. Because if you run d separation between e2 and any other variable, you'll see that always the path is blocked by this first triple that includes x2 in the middle. Either you have a causal reasoning triple there or you have a common cause triple, it's always blocked by the evidence in the middle. Little quiz. So these are the two main assumptions. Quiz here, does this mean that evidence variables are guaranteed to be independent? Concretely, are E1 and E3 independent? Who says yes, E1 and E3 are independent? Couple hands going up. Who says no, E1 and E3 are not guaranteed to be independent? 
More hands going up. Why? Over there. Yes. Yeah, so the reasoning is that you look at this path here from E1 to E3, and since nothing is observed, and all triples here are either a common cause or a causal reasoning triple, which are triples that are active whenever the middle node is not observed, we have a sequence of active triples connecting E1 and E3. So we have an active path between E1 and E3, which means we cannot claim anything about independence. Of course, once we block the path anywhere by either observing x1 or maybe observing x2 or x3 or all of them, then we do get the independence between e1 and e3. But you need to block the path somewhere to get the independence. Okay, what are some real HMM examples? What could be the state and the observations? Speech recognition. What is the state there? The state there are phonemes. So just these are little parts of speech, um, parts of sound that are the state, and you're trying to, you have maybe a couple hundred of those that are possible, you try to recover the sequence of phonemes that constitutes the auditory signal that you just recorded. The auditory signal itself is just a sound wave, so this is just real, a real number that varies over time. Often that real number that varies over time is, well, not real anymore because it's sampled, it's digitized, so you have a discrete number. But then what's usually done is you look at a window, maybe, um, several milliseconds long, and over that window, you compute a transformation, some kind of other representation of that signal. This could be the frequency content, for example. You look at the Fourier transform for that window in time, and then look at how much each frequency is present in that time window, and then the sensor observations are how much energy is in each of the bins of frequencies that you're willing to consider. That's a reasonable sketch of what happens in the observation model. We'll see a lot more about that next lecture. The state space model will model how often you go from one phoneme to another phoneme. So it's a transition model that you might build from data. You might collect data, a lot of speech, label it, annotate what phoneme comes after what phoneme throughout the entire speech corpora, corpus that you have. And then after that, you can just do counts. You can see how often did phoneme one come after phoneme two and so forth, and that way you can build a model. Then you can use that HMM to do speech recognition. On top of the phonemes, often there is another layer than in your model that will be the words. So words are constituted of phonemes, and so you get this HMM where there's this kind of double layer in your state, where part of the state is the phonemes, which is short audible sequences, and then on top of that, there is something um, that's a word. So we'll see a lot of more detail on that next lecture. Machine translation. Here's one way to think of machine translation. You have a sequence of words. Think of that sequence of words as just a noisy version of what you really want. All right? So say a sentence. Um, Artificial intelligence is super interessant. That's a sentence in Dutch. You just take those words and say, wow, those were really noisy things that the professor was saying. What he really was trying to do was trying to speak English. And you build a model where you have a transition model about English words, how often they occur behind each other. That's a transition model. You have a model that you just have from a dictionary, how often will an English word appear as some other word in Dutch? That's your HMM. And now all you need to do is run probabilistic inference in this HMM, and you would then get artificial intelligence is super interesting as your translation for that sentence. Um, robot tracking. What's the state space there? A robot has a position and maybe an orientation. If it's a mobile robot, let's say position orientation. So the model you have in the transition model is if, if a certain control was applied, how likely do you land in a new position and orientation? That's a lot like the agent in the grid worlds in RL. And then the observation model could be something where you say, well, if a robot is sitting right here and sends a laser beam across the room, then typically the measurement should be corresponding to the distance to the back wall there up to some noise. And so you have a distribution over possible measurements as a function of how far the nearest wall is away from the robot in a particular direction. 
That's that, the way the laser beam does it. It sends out the laser beam times how long it takes to get back, and then multiplies that with the speed of light to know how, how far away that wall is. So those are, those are a couple of examples, and we'll see those applications in more detail in, at the end of this lecture and the next lecture. So these are some real-world examples, and HMMs are maybe the base nets that you'll see the most in the real world. Even though if you look at them, they look like a very special case, this kind of special sequence of variables built up in a very particular way. They are probably the most frequently reoccurring base net. So running inference in an HMM is called filtering or monitoring. And because it's done so often, and to kind of have a shorthand notation where you're doing this, there's a new notation here, and BTX stands for the belief at time t over state variable x. And what it is a shorthand for is the probability distribution at time t for the variable xt, given the evidence that has been observed from time one through time t. It's just a new notation. Nothing new in principle, just shorthand notation. You start with b1, that's for time one, and as time passes, you update the belief, and sometimes you even leave out the time index. You just say, I'm updating the belief, and whenever you need to know the time, you put the time in there as an index. The first highly, or for which the application was highly visible version of this was the Kalman filter. The Kalman filter was invented uh, by Kalman when they were working on getting a rocket to go to the moon. And the rocket is the robot, the agent, right? You try to keep track of where the rocket is over time. And so the pose, position, orientation, velocity of the robot, in this case a rocket, are your state variables. And the sensory measurements you get are inertial measurements, maybe measurements from um, having a camera looking down at Earth or looking at the moon and stars and so forth, and based on that, determining the location of your rocket. So the common filter used continuous variables, which means that the math you do underneath does integrals rather than summations. But aside from that, it's really the same thing. So that was the first one, but there are a lot more applications since. We've seen some on the previous slide. So here's robot localization in a very kind of iconic example. Robot is over here. And this robot doesn't know it's there. As far as the robot is concerned, every square is equally likely they're equally gray. The task for the robot is to find out where it is. It has a model for how the world works. It has a sensor. In fact, its sensor senses in four directions. And if the measurement is noise-free, it'll know for each of these four directions whether there is a wall right there or not. So for this situation here, if things worked out OK, the sensors were noise-free, you'd get north, there is a wall, east, no wall, south, a wall, west, no wall. The sensor can make a mistake, each of these sensors. As a whole, you have no more than one mistake. So only one of them can be off at any given time. The motion model is the robot gets to move north, east, south, or west, and it usually succeeds, but not always. And now let's see what happens if we apply inference in a hidden Markov model with these emission and transition models underneath. So the robot starts there. We get a measurement where the green here means there was a wall measured, and red means no wall was measured. We run the probabilistic inference update. We haven't yet seen how that works, but you can imagine how it works because it's a base net, and you can, in principle, run variable elimination in your base net to get the posterior distribution. And this is what you get. Dark gray is where it's likely for the robot to be. Lighter is less likely. And the robot moves. This tends to spread out the distribution a little bit because the motion of the robot is noisy. So you go from a distribution that's a little more concentrated to one that's a little less concentrated when you move. Then you have a measurement again. Incorporating that measurement makes it more likely to be wherever there's a wall north and south of you and less likely to be wherever that's not the case. And so you get probability mass to concentrate, move, concentrate, and so forth. And as you go along, you see that after a couple of moves, in this case east, you get almost all the probability mass in just two spots, here and here. There's no way the robot could know in which one of these two spots it is based on the current information because it's completely symmetric so far. Moving one more. 
The symmetry gets broken. The measurement indicates that the north spot is the likely one. And now you have most likely localized your robot. Keep in mind, you're never sure with these, when you do probabilistic reasoning, these probabilities will almost never go to zero and one. There'll always be some non-zero probability for all states. So you just have very high probability mass on that particular state. Okay, what do we need to do? Inference, yes. The robot is just running inference. So the robot has a hidden Markov model of this type. And its sensor can sense whether there's a wall north, east, south, or west, so four measurements. And its transition model says that if you try to move east, you likely succeed. And there are some numbers there that we didn't specify. What it, what it means is that at time one, it, when it gets the measurement, this will be observed. It considers, considers this part of the base net runs variable elimination is one way to think of it, finds the distribution x1 given e1. Then it makes a move. It is now time two. And it gets to observe the sensory measurement over here. And now it runs inference in this bigger base net to find px2 given e1 and e2. And that process keeps repeating over time. In this case, X is the position of the robot, yes. Actually, let's take a short break before we get into the math of how this works. Okay, let's, uh, let's restart. So, if you look at inference in an HMM, two things happen. One thing that happens is time passes by, at which time you do an update to account for time having passed by. Another thing that happens is that you get an observation. We want to account for that. So these are the two base cases. When you know how each of these works, then you know how the whole system works. So the first one here is incorporation of evidence you have some state variable that you're trying to infer information about. You get to observe some sensory measurements in the evidence, var evidence variable E1 in this case. What you're interested in is finding this distribution over here. Now, for the basement that you have here, what you have is PX1, and you have PE1 given X1. Neither one of them is what you want. So you want to somehow Use them to get what you want. The way you're going to use them is just by using standard Bayes rule. So we have x1 given e1. Well, straightforward. That's a conditional probability. The joint of x1 and e1 divided by the distribution for e1. Um, since this thing here does not depend on x1, we can ignore it for now and say it's not going to be equal anymore, but it's going to be proportional to now, which is this sign over here. And for this expression here, the joint between x1 and e1 is the prior for x1 times the conditional of e1 and x1. And once we compute things this way, which would find us this expression over here, all we need to do is to renormalize, which is we'll compute this for all values of x1. This will give us a table of values of the type we find here is something of the type um, E1 will be fixed, X1, maybe plus X1, negative X1, and then we'll have the joint for X1, E1, there will be some number here, A, some number B, and you'll compute the renormalization constant Z equal A plus B, and then to find the conditional x1, given e1, you have a over z, b over z. So that's what we do to solve this problem. Fairly straightforward. You had the prior, you had the measurement model, just join them together and renormalize. This is one of the two main computations we're going to do here. Any questions about this computation?
Okay, here. So we didn't know the reason why that slide was there because we didn't finish it. Yes, so the reason we got rid of this is because we don't have we don't have it available. And we know that we're not going to need it per se because we can renormalize to account for it. Now, what is the case is that this z here actually is equal to PE1. So we're actually computing this as we go along in this process. So that's the evidence incorporation based case. How about time goes by? We have in this case a distribution for x1 and one for x2 given x1. Well, that's the same thing we already did for the Markov model in the very beginning of lecture, right? The same set of equations. We just have, let's get rid of this here. We have px2 is the sum over all instantiations of x1 of the joint between x1 and x2, which we then write out this way because these are the quantities we have available. What's going to change to do inference in a general HMM rather than just these two base cases? Here's all that's going to change. We're going to say, oh, we're going to do the same for all time. So instead of one, let's call this T, let's call this T, let's call this T. Here, let's call this T, let's call this T plus one, let's call this T. And now we have the general case. Now, in general, of course, this distribution here for XT will actually not be just P of XT. In general, this will be our belief that we found from previous computations. And same here, this will be the belief that we found from previous computations, which is equal to probability for XT given all past evidence. Actually here, it's before we get the evidence at time t, so up to time t minus one. So these base cases are really what we're going to be doing. The only additional thing is that we change the index from one and two to t and t plus one. The other thing we're doing is that we are always carrying around all the past evidence. So what we'll get here, out of here will be, we'll get p, xt given e1 through et, whereas here was only up to et minus one. And all that happened is that this stretch from e1 through et minus one just got carried around in the back of everything. As we've always done when we do probability computations, if you have additional stuff you want to put behind the conditioning bar, just keep it the same at all times and your computation will still be fine. Okay, so let's look at this in a little more detail. We have a belief for time t, which by definition is this quantity over here. One time step passes, well, this is the update. Time update says you take the current belief, multiply with the transition model, which connects you to the next time. This together here is p x t plus one comma x t given e one through t. This thing here, e1 through t, is a shorthand notation for e1, comma, e2, comma, and so forth till et. And then we're summing out over xt, which gives us what we have over here, where xt has disappeared, and we just have xt plus one. So the same passage of time as on the previous slide. More compactly, meaning just shorthand notation, but the same thing, we call this b prime. This prime here, stands for the fact that we have only incorporated evidence up to time t, not up to time t plus one. So this is x t plus one, but the evidence has only been incorporated up to time t, that's why we have the little prime here. Let's be explicit, this is equal to p x t plus one given e one through t. Okay, so all we do here is pushing beliefs through the transition model in a very natural way. Let's look at this in action. Let's say you are trying to find ghosts in a 
grid world, um, as time passes, these ghosts will be moving around. Initially, in this case, almost all the probability mass is over here. Time t equal two, doing this update, we get a more spread out probability mass. The ghost can try to move here because it tends to go around clockwise like that, but there is some noise. And so the probability mass tends to diffuse over time. Then time goes by and so forth, you reach time t equal five, this distribution over here. So you see that as time goes by, this distribution diffuses and maybe, you know, if you go for long enough, yes, you'll find some stationary distribution which might be uniform or maybe because of the asymmetry, because of the walls, it'll be a little bit away from uniform. So that's time updates. Just simulating what happens, but you're simulating not what actually happens, but propagating your probability distribution over what might be happening. Observation, same thing. Remember, this was the base case. We currently have B prime. That's available to us from the time update. Then what we're interested in is the conditional for x t plus one given all evidence, including time t plus one. Well, we just multiply in the sensory measurement with our current belief. This thing here together is equal to the joint of x t plus one and e t plus one given e one through t, which in turn is proportional to what we're after because we just have to divide by probability for et plus one to get an equality with the left-hand side over here. We don't have this available though, so we're just going to ignore it for now and we'll renormalize later. Equivalently, we can write this as the belief for x t plus one is proportional to this expression over here. All right, what do we do? It's just a join of two factors and then a renormalization. Intuitively, what's happening is that whenever a state is very likely, you'll reweigh it by something high because the evidence is very compatible with it. And whenever a state is very unlikely for the current evidence, you'll weigh it down. And we normalize. Any questions about the observation update? Yes. Um, will it be more complicated? No. But the variables will not be binary variables. So the variables for the ghost grid, the variable that represents the state of the ghost, if it's, let's say, a five by five grid, the ghost can be in 25 different positions, then that variable will have a domain that has 25 possible values. Same for the sensory measurement, you'll be able to measure different colors, and so it'll have more than just two values in the domain. So, in some sense, we're hiding the complexity of the domain of, um, of the problem inside the domains and inside the conditional probability tables. It's not fully exposed. But yeah, underneath you'll do more computation than if it were just binary domains for each of them. Okay, for, for the um, transition model here, yeah. it will be a table of the form P xt plus one given xt, right? And we'll have entries for xt plus one and xt. This is a, let's see, six horizontally and four vertically. So xt plus one could be one, one, could be one, two, one, three, one, four. Then it could be two, one, two, three, two, 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 three, two, four, and so forth. This will keep going for a while, 24 entries. And this is just for x t equals one comma one. And then x t will take on its next value in the table, which will be maybe one comma two. And x t plus one will be able to take on all 24 values for that. So you'll have a table of size, in this case, 24 by 24. 
to represent the entire conditional probability table. The sensor has an auto table of its own. The sensor will have a table depending on exactly the type of sensor, but let's say you had a, we used to have a red, orange, yellow, green sensor. Let's say you had that one, there would be a distribution for sensor measurement, I guess we call it E at time t, given x at time t, we would have x at time t, e at time t, this would be red, orange, yellow, green, for x t being 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and it would keep going. That should be, let's see, um, it also, de it'll depend on where you, where you measure, I guess. You'll have, you'll have to say where you are measuring here because the number here will depend on how far away you are measuring from where the ghost is. So there'll be an additional dependence there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this also will be a very large table, 24 by four in this case. Um, the way we typically represented this one is just by distance to where the ghost really is, which is a more compact way of representing it, but you'll, if you want to run the inference in the canonical way, you'll want to expand it into a table that looks like this. All right, so that's inference in an HMM. Here is an example for the case of observations. We were running the time updates until time five. This is what we ended up with. At that time, a sensor measurement comes in. We measured orange over there. We do the observation update, get a new distribution that now is more concentrated on certain positions for the ghost. One thing to notice here that in general, it's not necessary to get an evidence variable at each time. You could have evidence variables only at time one maybe, and then five, and then 20, and then 35, and so forth. You can keep doing time updates, you keep running your time updates until you get an evidence variable that comes in, then you do your evidence update for that evidence variable, and you keep going that way. So they don't have to be coming in at every time step. Here's our other example. We start with a uniform distribution over whether it's raining or not. Then that means for the assumptions we make here, this particular model, at the next time, after doing the time update, we still have a uniform distribution. Then we get to observe, or the grad student gets to observe that the professor is carrying the umbrella, which shifts more of the weight of the distribution onto the rain. We now have 81.8% chance of rain in the distribution. That comes from the, so we have here the time update, and here the observation update. Here we have time again, and we have, here we have the observation. We label them, this one is B, we have no evidence, B1 for X1. This one here is B2, oh, this is zero, let's call it zero. This is B1 prime X1. This one here is B1, X1. This one here is B2 prime, X2. And this one here is B2, X2. Another way to write what we just did is to write it in what is called a forward algorithm format. So what we've done so far, we've said there is time lapses and there is evidence that comes in. For each one of them, we know what to do and we can do it as we go along. That's one of the most natural ways to implement it. You just do it one step at a time. You could also decide to put those in one computation. So you say, time has passed, and evidence has come in, and I'm gonna incorporate both of them in one update. It doesn't really do anything else. It's just a different way of grouping your computation. So here's what that looks like. Um, you're interested in getting this one here, from the one at the previous time, which is the one for x t minus one, given the evidence from one through t minus one. And of course, your model, which is a transition model and the evidence model. So you write this out to include x t minus one. Then you 
explicitly write out what this distribution looks like in that particular format of basenet that you have, right? It's xt, xt minus one jointly with all the past evidence, then the conditional for xt given xt minus one and the conditional for the evidence given xt. Remember you have xt, xt minus one, and the evidence ET sitting over here, and then the past evidence is sitting further back. So we just use the structure of the base net to get this format out. Then we reorganize the order of summation and multiplication. That's a standard variable elimination trick. That's how you speed up your computation for inference to go from standard inference by enumeration to variable elimination. We see that XT minus one is being summed over. It doesn't appear in here. So this thing is being brought up front. And now this is what we compute with. And what we see is that we have in the back here, what we do for the time update. And then multiplying this in gives us the observation update. What we see is that standard variable elimination in the ordering x1, then x2, x3, and so forth will lead to the same algorithm as we just looked at where we said, let's do a time update, then an evidence update, a time update, then an evidence update, and so forth. You can do it either way, whatever you prefer, um, but often splitting into time and observation updates is a little more intuitive, and whenever no observations come in, then that's nice, you can just skip that part. Okay. So as a summary, this is what we have. We have a way to update over time to find xt given all the past evidence. And we have a way to incorporate evidence, which now go, we go from this one here to this one here, which is the final belief for time t. This is the algorithm we've looked at so far. There are some limitations to this algorithm. What are the limitations? Well. Mainly computational. We looked at the tables for the ghost. There was a question there, what does that look like? What do the tables look like? They were pretty big, 24 by 24. You're dealing with those tables. That's just for one ghost. You can imagine there being multiple ghosts. You can imagine there being many more things you're trying to track than just ghosts. And so what ends up happening is that if your domain size is pretty large, which it tends to be in these models because we put everything in the state in one super variable, x, right? You can have a very large domain. This can get very expensive. The space complexity is the size of the domains, x, and the time complexity is order x squared. So if you have a large state space, let's say 100 ghosts that you're trying to track, which each could be maybe in 100 different positions, then you'd have 100 to the 100 squared computational complexity to work through this, which is too slow. So what we're gonna look at next lecture is a way to speed up this process by introducing a new type of sampling that is specifically tailored to HMMs so we can get this to work on much larger state spaces. All right, that's it for today. <laughs>